I want to thank you all for hanging in, and I want to thank you all for pulling your way, uh, pulling yourselves away from the hot donuts. Ugh. What a way to end a day! Wow. Um, as I said before, we have we have two more things coming up. The first is uh, is Mike Wertheimer, who, as he said uh, uh, earlier today, he wants to talk to you about kind of what this all means, because he really is, al along with Tom, he's, he's the power behind a lot of what you're seeing going on. He's, the, he's the, not only the idea man, but the catalyst uh, in, in, in helping uh, um, get this new workforce what they need. And so we want to hear from Mike, and he's going to especially talk a little bit more about uh, what this should mean to industry. Then I'm going to come up, and I'm going to talk just a couple minutes very quickly about kind of the next steps, both the, the following Q&A session as well as the October 11th session. And, and then we'll close the conference and get ready for the, uh, for the reception and dinner tonight. Okay, so let's hear from Mike. Mike? First of all, my uh, thanks to the press for uh, filling in. Uh, Rush Holt was our featured speaker, but he just couldn't get out of, uh, out of Washington because of the voting. And they really stepped up to do an extraordinary job, a gutsy job, too. And I, and I really do appreciate that. Uh, there is a slide that we're going to put up. Uh, is that ready? OK. Uh, that URL, if you go visit it right now or any time, you will find uh, we have now captured every video, every slideshow. You can now view them at this site. Uh, I'm told as of Monday they'll actually have down links for them for you to download. Um, if you don't know how to download it from this point, go see this table right here. You'll know if you're Gen Y or Gen X or Gen W uh, by whether or not that stops you from downloading what's up there. Uh, so. Go back and just leave that what leave it up. And that's going to stay up for at least a couple of weeks, I'm told. Is that right? Yep. A couple of weeks it'll be up. But you can see every single talk we've given, uh, all the slides. We had promised that earlier, uh, and write that down. Okay. Uh, it's late in the day. I know you're tired. I'm going to um, ask for your indulgence to talk about something uh, not about the delivery. Uh, I will get to that, I promise. But uh, in exchange for your indulgence, I'll, I'll try and be brief. Uh, I will be brief. I wanted to know what's the last message you should think about, about analytic transformation, before we move on to what it is your role will be uh, beginning tomorrow morning, when you start giving us questions, and then in October, when you come back and actually give us feedback. What's the last message I wanted to leave you with? Uh, and I thought really hard about it. I asked the guys around here, some of the younger folks, everybody, what do you think is the last message? And I want to instead give you that message via a story. And I think probably everyone, no matter what age you are, what experience you've had, uh, there's probably been a few events in your life that were really defining, helped fo bring things into focus for you, help uh, establish what I talked about in my first talk about that baseline below which you don't compromise. That gives you your value system. So let me tell you something that we danced around, but we haven't explicitly talked about. Uh, as I, if you recall, I joined uh, the National Security Agency in 1982. I want to talk to you about 1990. Uh, in the summer of 1990, I was at what we call SCAMP. SCAMP is uh, the crypt crypto mathematician's version of SHARP. It's, uh, we spent a summer working hard problems with academia and the like. So I was out on the West Coast uh, working on SCAMP, on, uh, and I can't really tell you what the target was, but it was a really fun cryptographic challenge. And if you recall, uh, in the summer of 1990, Iraq invaded Kuwait. And we went into what we call Desert Shield. Now immediately, the SCAM continued remarkably the commitment to the long-term research stay, but a big chunk of the group, uh, mostly the coders and those uh, who are intimately involved with that problem, the cryptographic problems associated with Desert Storm and Desert Shield, flew back to Washington. So I continue to work that summer watching what's happening in the Middle East like everybody else, but really not playing in it. 
Uh, when I got back in the fall, as you, as you recall, there were diplomatic attempts early to get Kuwait uh, liberated without force, and then we were building up forces. And by the time I got back to NSA in the fall, the, uh, I was sort of out of the group that was working that problem. But an opportunity came up uh, to work shifts, because once the fighting started, uh, we had 24-7, and we had put together the cryptographic capability, the signals, and obviously we're collecting every signal we could in theater. And to spell the folks that were working so hard, writing programs, getting all the systems together, uh, those of us with experience but not on that target uh, would volunteer. So I started working, I think, uh, the first few times, uh, like four to midnight shifts. And my goal was to sit at, my job was to sit at a workstation. And as the communications would come in, occasionally a demodulation would fail or something would fail. And I was learned how to, you know, tweak the algorithms, reset some dials, and get it forward so that the cuts, uh, whatever kind of signals intelligence could be processed and so forth. And we had set up in this room monitors television monitors with CNN feeds. Now, if, I, I don't know how many of you remember this. Uh, we were stationed largely uh, forward deployed into Saudi Arabia at that time. That's where our jets took off from Saudi Arabia air bases. They would fly over and do their sorties, uh, especially if you remember in Desert Storm, this is one of the first times we did a lot of heavy bombing before we put the ground troops forward. So what would happen is the following. Uh, we would be sitting there, and the computer, while the room was quiet, and everybody's working around their computers, computers aren't making noises, but I'd have screens, and I'd see, you know, uh, uh, lines and lines of information. Another signal came in, a signal came in from over here, and it'd be flashing through my screen. When we'd look up on the, on the wall, we'd see the planes taking off to run their sorties. And about 20 minutes later, however long it took for the plane to get over the, the area, uh, then the screens would stop flowing data because the uh, Iraqis, fearful that their communications would cause our bombs to have something to hone in on, in other words, we could target them by virtue of their communications, would go radio silent. and would be dead silent on their side. Now, most of you think of war as an extremely, and those of you who have actually lived through it, it's an extremely loud experience. Uh, jet bombers are deafeningly loud. I think they're meant to be. Bombs going off, bullets. It's a very, very, very loud and disturbing experience. The curious thing was back at NSA, it was just the opposite. When the war was going on, when the drops were being, uh, the bombs were being dropped, it's a silent time. All the signals stop. The screen kind of goes blank. And most people would get up and they'd go get, that's a good time to get their coffee while the bombing was going on, or go get their snack. You, you, just what you would expect. Because when the, when the planes would now return, we'd know before they'd return because we'd start seeing the signals starting to wake up. And then we'd look up on the screen and 10 minutes later we'd see the planes land. Um, that experience was uh, uh, profoundly affected me in a weird way. Um, it, as if the silence had a certain quality to it. You sit there and it's quiet. There's nothing coming on your screen. There's no visual cues. None of your senses are being touched. And all you can think about is there are planes being shot at, there are bombs being dropped, there are people being killed, and there's a war being fought. And you're just sitting there and you're in the peacefulness. Uh, it, it, it's the most contradictory kind of silence I ever experienced. And it profoundly affected me uh, that people were dying out somewhere, and I'm sitting in a room, and it's quiet. And when they were back out of harm's way, I got busy again, and it got loud and boisterous. And when it got loud and boisterous in the room, a couple of things happened. Now, I was, um, so I've been there about eight years. I may be a GS 13 or 14 at this point. And it's the first time I had ever seen our country genuinely in a war, I, and I mean that Haiti wasn't quite the, Haiti wasn't the experience, Panama, you can think of all the things that happened in between 82 and 90. This was the first time we were really at it. Uh, and I watched how people came together. There wasn't any drop of information that didn't flow. There wasn't anyone who took no for an answer. People stayed in other people's faces till the answer was yes. Somehow the imperative that we had troops on the ground, the heroes who wear the uniforms, was so compelling 
that I saw people who hated each other, genuinely during the day, just didn't like each other, working together on problems. I was shocked at that. And to this day, I, it's a visceral kind of silence that I think about that day. And I, and I watched the passion in that room in silence. And I want to tell you this story because the generation that we've kept talking about, this 50% this, um, of the workforce and higher, they have never known peace. They came into our, our community with a community at war, and they've never had a chance to know what it's like, how this community works strategically and otherwise, when we're at peace. And the passion that we saw, what, what saddens me is that we've been at this long enough that people now are starting not to share all the time. That people are taking no for an answer again. But we've somehow, even in war, we've become numbed to fighting the battles that we need to fight to save lives. And my message would be, uh, when I walked out after 1990, ever since then, it's been that we ought to risk our lives for peace. We should have a passion for peace the way we have a passion when we're at war. We should be collaborating, we should be risking our lives to protect the peace, not sources and methods. We're, we are so protective of our sources and methods. People should be willing to die to keep the peace. And I'm trying to create an environment, I'm trying to articulate to you an environment that we all share so these young people can see that we can collaborate in peacetime as well as war. They've never seen what it's like when we thought strategically, when we took six months, a year, two years, five years to study a single problem. How about the Cold War, where we studied 20, 30 years to understand certain problems? So the, the collaborative environment, A space, the library, put them all aside. We're trying to create that environment that inspires young people to risk it all for peace, not just for the warfighter. God forbid, peace is going to break out someday. And where are we going to be if we've designed every single thing in our, in our community, every piece of intelligence, every um, acquisition to fight wars? So I want to leave you with that. I, I don't know that it inspires you or it depresses you. Uh, I think that everyone should walk home at the end of this conference and think, when the peace breaks out, what will we have left them? What is the legacy? What are you going to do tomorrow to make it easier for them, to make it feel more comfortable when they go home? Uh, I will tell you quickly, um, after 9-11, I was as despondent as the next person. Uh, I would never claim more. But I was pretty bad off. I was a senior executive of the National Security Agency, and I was very, very much felt that I hadn't fought hard enough for the things that might have made a difference. And I'll never forget my father pulling me aside. Here's this 80-year-old man for whom I had nothing in common anymore. And he pulled me aside and he said, what are you doing? And he told me how he had lived through World War II. He'd lived through the Depression and Vietnam and all the other tremendous things that shaped uh, 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 the 20th century. He said, I, I don't hold you responsible. I need you back at work. I sleep better with you back at work trying to solve these problems. And then he said something that really shocked me. He said, you're scaring your children. You're scaring my grandchildren. You're working 60, I used to come home for dinner, and then I'd go right back after dinner back to work. He says, you're not doing any good for, for your family. You're scared. People are overseas fighting so that you aren't scaring your children, so that you should live as much a normal life. That's why we're trying to take the fight where the fight should be and not fighting it on our shores. So from that day forward, I sort of committed myself that these young people should grow up and live in an environment where they can do their work efficiently, can do it with a sense of purpose, with a sense that they can go home after eight or nine hours, whatever the day is. Some days it's 12, some days maybe it's four. But they feel at the end of the day they've accomplished something and that their children will see them happy. And they won't be afraid to live in America that still has to fight a global war on terror. So if I can give you one piece of my heart, that is it. And everything else is just commentary of what we talked about. Now, let me completely shift gears for you and say, what do I expect from you now, uh, the folks who pay their money 
and have very, very patiently listened for two days of us spilling out to you what we think we want to do, and yet haven't told you how you're going to make money at it, how you're going to, uh, more to the point, add creativity, go from the good to the great. DNI, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, is about reforming everything we can possibly reform that's broken. But to do it in ways, let's not try to do it all at once. So, I hope you saw in General Myros's talk that he sees analytic transformation as a way for him to do the transformation writ large. He's talking about A space. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, it will never be called A mash. All right? <laughs> I will give an award to anyone who comes up with a better name. I'll take a better name, but it'll never be a mash. Uh, and I teased him about that, too. It's the springboard. Eventually, it'll be iSpace or whatever it is, intelligence space. And the library will be some way of how we think about all our data in time. Good to great. What do I need from you? Starting tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., and you'll get the instructions on the sheet, you can start feeding in the questions that we haven't answered explicitly for you. We will load up those questions. Give us a, the sooner you start providing them, the sooner we will be able to uh, get you answers and more thoroughly give you answers. On the 13th of September, I think we're scheduled for four or five hours to be online. And we will have the developers, we will have the thinkers, we will have everyone who's got a stake in this in the room ready to answer your questions so you can get uh, the baseline. So that if we're taking a technological or sociological path that will lock out some great concept that you have, that's the time to correct it. Get us straightened out and say, you made the wrong technical choice here for this reason. That's what we want to start you to think about. Number two, come in October. What is the most important thing by October do we want from you? I would encourage you to do the following. Don't be tool-based, be concept-based. I want you to tell me the Library of National Intelligence. If you build an object-oriented database, we can unleash the following possibilities for you. If you build a highly dimensional database, if you do a relational database, whatever it is that you see as a vision to take this two levels beyond anything we've thought, put that concept down. Try to do it. We'll, we'll give you a, a um, sort of a template that we would recommend, but like the one-pagers in your book. Try to synopsize a concept in a page of all the different concepts that you see in analytic transformation going. What we want to do, here's my commitment to you, is we will take all these one-pagers and we will listen to you on the 11th. We will stitch them together. We will take all the time that it is necessary, full time if necessary. We will look at it right away. We will stitch this, these concepts together into a big tapestry of analytic transformation. All the concepts you gave us, one big picture. Remember, concepts, not tools, and that's important. I want to take a binder that's this thick or however thick of all your ideas and concepts. And I want to take them, and I want to, as we massage them and stitch them together into one big picture, I want to walk into Al Munson, the senior executive for acquisition, who's talking about reforming acquisition. I'm going to say, sir, this is analytic transformation. How do we acquire it? He's looking, I'm going to tell him flat out, we can't acquire it by taking every one of these little concepts, developing requirements, and have you all bid on it. That will take forever. And if you want to go through some existing vehicle today that cuts out too many of the small players, he keeps talking. How are we going to have fast, re fast, accurate, reliable acquisition? Let analytic transformation drive how we change doing acquisition in the DNI and for the community. The way I can do that is to stitch together your concepts and show him the possibilities and say, if we don't get it, it's your fault now. I don't, if it's acquisition is the reason we can't succeed, I want to know it. And that'll be the next arrow I take. Uh, but I will fight for you on that. You've got to give me the material by which I can go to the, the system acquisition and say, this is what we need. You must be creative and, and compelling. And then, when I say, here's the piece, here's the concept, advanced search, whatever it is, then you can compete on a level field because IA will have architected in a way that you can compete 
I've done that right. That's through your feedback early. And you can compete like you should compete. And if you do it on the concept level, I don't have to get into too much of your proprietary technology. Now, I want you to think about what I said, because over, uh, I'm sure you'll attack me at dinner, and I, and, and I encourage you to. I encourage you to attack me on the, uh, between now and September 13th on, I like this, I don't like it, let's do it this way, let's do it that way. So on the 13th, we can have a little more clarity for you, and we'll set up the templates. Not requiring you to follow this, you may have an even more creative way. Um, I didn't want to take too much time. I wanted to challenge you to come back to me and what is, what is industry, private sector, public sector transformation on how I should go about mining what it is that you have to offer. Now, I hope, uh, are we on for the chat room or am I taking, um, I, I really rather you ask the questions at this point. Oh, right there, a microphone on its way. No, not low and full. <laughs> Mark, what can I answer for you? All right, I've sat here for two days and I've listened. Here's my question. You are urging this transformation for an end that I do not understand. I've, I've listened to all the piece parts and I've read the, the pamphlet, which I think is wonderful, by the way, in terms of explaining what you want to do. But I don't understand what's driving the transformation. This is going to be like a question in the form of it. It's like a Bob Trinan kind of question, which Tim understands. There is a question at the end of it. Um, <laughs> Collaboration is not an end in itself, to my mind. You want to do this, I think, if I heard what you said and what Tom said, to make an analysis better. What does that mean? It means it would be faster. It would be more comprehensible it would be more accurate more often. I don't think you have a way of knowing at the end of the day, like you said yesterday, when you get there. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of this is pandering to a bunch of commissions that had no understanding of what we do for a living, or the nature of our work, and to a workforce. And I don't think that's a sufficient grounds for transformation. So I, I'm left here wondering, what's the, what's the end state for what reason? OK. Um, I suspect that no answer will be satisfactory because of the way the question was posed. I meant that, I didn't mean that meanly. I, uh, I mean, that's a hard question, and the way it's posed is why, and, and we always ask why. Um, I've been here only two years since I came back into, the, into government from two years in industry. Uh, so in those two years, I went around and talked to analysts, and I've tried to figure out what are the hard problems. You know, we have this national intelligence priorities framework. And, I, and well, of course Mark knows. Um, and I, I am struck by the fact that, for example, uh, North Korea is considered a hard target. Uh, no, I'm not surprised. What surprises me is that North Korea has been a hard target ever since North has been an adjective that modifies <laughs> Korea. <laughs> so I looked around, who's, who's thinking about this differently? And then I found a group of folks who took an extraordinary risk. By the way, if you want to work some of these hard problems, there will be managers who tell you it's a career killer to go because they've been plowed over so many times. You won't get anywhere. And what they did was they picked a part of North Korea they wanted to essentially what, what we call a whiteboard. In other words, erase all, they started to look at what did we know about this. And they started to go back and they said, well, here's, the, here's our baseline uh, analytic, we've all agreed to this. This is the analytic part that got the stamp of approval. And then they went to, what, well, what did you base that on? And then they started to trace the sourcing backwards. And eventually, the sourcing dried up. In other words, they could not find anything for the original sourcing. It just seemed to keep going back. And, and when they finally got to the end of the trail, there was nothing there. So they said, let's take all the assumptions off the table. And they went and they said to NSA uh, um, on this problem, do you have anything 
nothing we do is relevant because of this. And they said, well, the because we don't allow you to, to rely on anymore. And little by little, they started to stitch together and had some of the most spectacular breakthroughs on this problem we've had since North became the adjective in front of Korea. Completely have rewritten the book. And how do they do it? Um, and before, I didn't, I just watched. They collaborated in ways that they never collaborated before. They shared information that was always in the past considered uh, uh, irrelevant to the problem. They took a completely contrarian view, and so on. And they were hard to manage. They pretty much said, we don't care what you tell us. We're going to try anyway. A lot of people took a risk. I have about four of those stories. It's not enough to go on, because hard problems are hard. Every one of them has thing, these things in common. Big breakthroughs on what we thought were impossible problems. And those big breakthroughs came through from multi-int, multi-agency, collaboration, a clever use of tools that weren't designed for the problem that they were able to modify. The themes, were, the themes for the hard problems seem to be the same. It's a small sample. So what am I doing here? I'm spending a little bit of money to create a new environment for which, if that's a model that works, this will be the environment in which it not only can work, but can excel. That's about the best I can do for you. And I won't apologize for trying. I won't apologize because I'm not saying to the community, analytic, there is one analytic transformation. As I said at the beginning, this is about allowing many, many cultures to exist simultaneously and cooperatively, I don't have to change what's working. There are people who don't need to collaborate. There are those rocket scientists who just need to be left in the room to work hard on a problem. So be it. Let's let many cultures survive. What I don't like is the thought that transformation is changing something from the past to something new. Don't think of it that way. Transformation is creating an environment in which more things can happen than could happen in the past. It's liberating. Let's call it analytic liberal liberation. And, and Mark, I'm sorry, that's the best I got. Uh, I just have a follow-on comment on that. <clears throat> I think that we've heard a lot about demographic shift and, and a lot about demographic change. And, and I, like Mark, I was, I was, I've spent two days asking myself the same question. What, have we lost sight of the question we were trying to answer with this and started looking at a different question? But I don't, I don't know that the alternative question is any less important. Uh, the demographic shift that's occurring in the intelligence community has meant that there are a lot of people with very little experience. And Jeffrey Cooper's uh, excellent paper that came out recently on um, curing uh, analytical pathologies talks a lot about the problem of mentoring young analysts and the fact that the way that this used to be done in the intelligence community during the Cold War uh, can't happen now because we don't have enough graybeards to do it. Uh, it used to happen over an extended period of time where you learned your tradecraft at the feet of the master. Well, there's not enough masters left at this point, and there are increasing numbers of, of grasshoppers coming in uh, looking for their guru. Uh, and as a result, I think that what this, what this effort is giving is a way of leveraging the remaining experience that exists in the, in the community. Uh, it, it does create some problems for those who have this experience because it's going to create more work for them. And that's a problem that's going to have to be addressed in terms of their own productivity. But I think that, that this is, in the short to medium term, an essential way of getting people up to speed uh, on, on their accounts. And then in the long run, it addresses the way that these same people like to do business. And it gives them the environment in which to thrive that they're used to, that you've made very clear with some of the younger analysts. So in this respect, although it may not be answering the, the question that I think I came in thinking it was, it was looking at, and that is, how do we improve analysis? I think the question of how do we deal with the demographic change in the intelligence community is, is uh, just as important. 
Uh, you're absolutely right. Um, I think the numbers, the last I heard, uh, and they seem to be growing, right? But of the, forget, put the 50 percent aside. Of the 50 percent who aren't newly hired, uh, roughly half of those are within five years of retirement, is the demographic. So we've got half here new, one quarter is our middle, is the leadership essentially, and the, la the high quarter is getting ready to head out the door. Um, I, I know the mentoring stuff, and all I can tell you is we've got to deal with it. Deal with the fact that maybe we go downhill for a little bit. You know, I, someone was saying, I, maybe it was Tom Finger, he, he said this is the uh, metaphorical notion of changing the, plane, the wings on the airplane while it's flying. I think we can do it without crashing, <laughs> believe it or not. I just think we're going to take a dive for a little while before we can climb out of it. We're going to have to make that investment. We simply are going to have to make a little bit of an investment there. Um, uh, I don't know if we can lower expectations reasonably, especially in a time of war. Uh, maybe you guys can use, God forbid, <laughs> remember I've been trying not to say this is about technology, but maybe, maybe technology can lessen the blow in the near term in ways if we're just creative enough to give it a try. Uh, our Razor team has absolutely convinced me that young people are capable of learning in one year what most take four to do. It takes a lot of resources. It doesn't scale. Maybe it, it will never scale. It costs us a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of work to get them there. But it's possible. Now if we can find ways to do that better and cheaper, maybe this demographic becomes the opportunity we just haven't realized, even in the near term. But uh, your point is, is spot on. Uh, we have questions here. Um, there are a lot of differing versions of LNI, A-Space, and Catalyst purported during the conference. Is there any way to get a written document for each program stating what requirements are needed for all three programs? This, I think, would help the tool providers. Uh, we have Intellipedia pages, and I think, uh, it, I'm going to say this out loud, but I want someone to correct me. The functional requirements for A space, are they classified? Can we, can we publish those? I, okay, so we, here's what we're going to do. The, the current functional requirements for all these programs are unclassified. We'll put them on the website. Is that fair? I can do that? There, which website? Yeah, uh, yeah, but that's Intel Link Q, and they don't have Intel Link Q. So we'll have to put it on the site. Perhaps we'll load them up on the site that you're going to go to for the 13th. So let's do that. Um, quite frankly, it's not a bad thing to have, for every three people, four different opinions about what this should be. Um, at the end of the day, we have to make some decisions. Let's put the functional requirements on. If that doesn't get you far enough, and we'll get them up real fast, send us the notes on the site and we'll, and we'll try and find if we can't take more of the Intellipedia pages, declassify them or make sure they're unclassified and load them up for you. We, we have many, many pages on uh, pr principles, precepts, functional requirements, con ops, uh, everything. So let's move that onto the unclassified network to the extent we can. That, I, I can do that. Is acquisition going to be addressed only for DNI or will the implications reach across the 16 agencies? Do COTS products have to be tied to services, vehicles in order to get in the game? The first half, is acquisition going to be addressed only for the DNI? Absolutely not. DNI is not seeking to become an acquisition organization. The DNI is, is, is established, the acquisition organization in DNI is to establish acquisition policy for the, six, for the 16 community members. I, I hope that's absolutely clear. It is not the DNI's job to run big programs and do major acquisitions. It, it, we have absolutely no plan to do that, and you shouldn't want us doing it. Uh, so it is the goal of, to set the uh, policies for the community. I don't know the answer about COTS products being tied to service vehicles. Um, if someone knows that answer, I'm happy to defer. Okay, what's next? How can vendors get access to these user groups FRDs, etc. Uh, I don't understand the question. What's an FRD? Functional requirement document? Not bad for a math guy. Uh, so we're going to have it on that site, right? There, what happens is when you log into the site for the 13th, 
there are folders. There's a catalyst folder, a, a library folder. We'll pop them in those folders. You'll be able to actually see documents in these chat rooms. So we'll put all the functional requirements and stuff in the, in the documents, and I think we handed out a sheet of paper. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. uh, if I don't answer your question, you can chirp up. You don't have to type it in again. Please comment about the plans to integrate the many collaborative tools that have been presented. It seems that the DNI has made strides in thinking about that, about technology. How can I improve product and collaboration? But how will you proceed to make these tools and the intent behind them systemic? Um, I'm going to give you an answer that might in the long term prove that I'm wrong. I think we may need to go. And I, and I would like to encourage you to think about it. If the model is right, and this has to be a little more viral, so that it isn't, a, it isn't if we don't make it viral, I, I just love General Clapper's dead horse mentality. <laughs> Boy, that was, a, that was priceless. Um, I don't want to make a dead horse. So why can't we have five different tools that do the same thing and let them compete like they do everywhere else inside A space? And the ones that get used, we keep, and the ones that don't. Now, what's going to make a tool get used more than another tool? The ease of use, the, un the unnecessary uh, training. Can they figure it out quickly? Is it, does it have the look and feel of what they're comfortable with? And then you survive just like everything else. So I claim if you have, you're going to want to price it, you're going to want to think about how you put it in there to compete in a viral marketplace that allows me to have all three competitors' tools working at the same time. If we do one-time certification, it's cheaper for you and it's cheaper for us. And I think I'd rather have, and rather than have you worry about getting it certified for 16 different agencies, I'd rather have you get it certified once and do it six, for 16 tools that all do the same thing and let you fight over it. I, I just, why, why do I, my laptop's full of tools that do the same thing. It's just this one's a little better here and it's a little better there and I'm happy to do it that way. So that's the model I'd like to approach. I want to say, I'm going to go out on a limb. Gone are the days. Uh, this happens all the time. We back up. People say, oh, I got this tool. It's wonderful. I love it. And I say to them, yeah, uh, w uh, is it um, service oriented? Yep. This tool, this tool, all plugs into ours, no problem. I said, does yours plug into theirs? And the blood drains from their face. Everyone wants to own the baseline. That's been the model in the community forever. Get our, get our infrastructure in, and then everyone can, we, we'll let others pile on top. Those days are gone. Not in a service-oriented architecture, not in web services. Your stuff is going to have to collaborate with everybody else's and vice versa. And that's done uh, uh, through the standards we're putting together with the CIO for how to do uh, um, XML tagging and so forth and so on. And those are questions you should all be asking for the people on the 13th. Do you have an example of what a successful analytic process and product looks like? Absolutely. Here's a notional example. Google Earth. How about Google Earth where now I can provide special imagery where it makes special Im imagery? How about a SIGINT plane I can put on top, which has emitters somewhere? How about a geospatial plane that has caves? I think I mentioned this last time. Multi-layers that I can build up my own mashup would be a tool like that that allows each of these silos or these cylinders of excellence to create uh, uh, their own planes that we can overlay on top of each other. So I have a second process that asks, uh, Claudine may have shown some of you uh, her, she does avian flu, so an outbreak here, she can overlay where the chicken farms are and where are the veterinarians and what's the density of population. I want to do that for even our most sensitive data. That's a visual application. How about a signal processing package? Uh, how about machine translation at different layers? I get something come in, does a first layer translation, then an entity extraction, then a disambiguation engine. That's the kind of thing we need. Modular. Go for your sweet spot. Don't try to, the end-to-end -end thread is dead. We don't, if you try and pitch end-to-end -end solutions, I warn you, it's not going to fit. One of the reasons we have to go web services, you don't want thick client solutions. Because then I got to deploy them and hit the security policies in all those agencies and they have to put software on their computer. If I can put it on a web server or multiple web servers and feed it as a web service, 
I don't have to fight that demon. Don't make me fight demons. It's a hydra. You cut off a head and two will replace it. Uh, make it easy on us to do that. Will competing products in A-Space have to be in our deck to participate? Absolutely not. Uh, although we're trying to make our deck something that you will be excited about, a place where you can test your tools on genuine data with genuine analysts in the identical environment as the classified network. So once you, if it works there, it's plug and play in the other one. That's the, but you're not required to use our deck by any stretch. How long would such an evaluation period last before a buy decision is made? Um, that's a great question. Let me put it back to you. For your model, for your business case, in order to play in our deck, what is the turnaround time that you need to demand from me? Do, if you're telling my business model says, I can't put it out and have you sit on it for 12 months, or I need to, I need to have some feedback within four months or six months, you gotta let me know and then we'll build it in the process. I can't tell you what, you should drive that answer, not me. And I will work to make that, what's the right answer for you, I will work uh, slavishly to make that happen on our end. That's a promise I, I should be able to make. How do you envision engaging functions across ODNI that inherently or peripherally help drive analytic transformation? For example, human capital. Uh, that, that, that is really a great question. Um, how do, so I'm telling you I'm trying to drive acquisition. And I'm trying to drive IT. Uh, now I have to drive HR. Uh, yeah, wins enough for you guys. Um, I'm trying, you know, I, I want you to talk some more amongst yourselves and with Reed and, and, and Renee about Razor. Uh, a little small thing. I think it's really working and we still can't sell it. We still just can't quite sell it yet. Uh, I don't know exactly why. Um, the human component, when you're trying to get others to embrace ideas that were invented elsewhere or conceived elsewhere, uh, that's just a problem about society. The question isn't that. The question is, how do you give them ownership of a piece of analytic transformation? That's our, I am trying to give HR a piece of analytic transformation. I am trying to give the CIA, I am not trying. They are embracing taking a piece. I gave some to DIA, would you please help me on A-Space? Take ownership, lead us. I asked CIA, take ownership of the Library of National Intelligence. That is our plan. We are going to plans and policy, we've gone to public affairs, we've gone to legislative affairs, and we're giving them ownership. We lose con some control. And part of, the, part of the negative of losing control is that the vision gets watered down or gets diverse. The reason there are many different views of A space in the library is because we've given ownership to, to so many folks. Uh, I don't think that's a bad thing. Uh, that's the trade off. HR, uh, for example, you know there's this joint duty requirement. Or maybe you've heard about that. First group in the entire I intelligence community to get joint duty credit is if you're on the Razor team. We were the first ones to get sign off. For the whole intelligence community, you join Razor, you've got your joint duty done for the rest of your career. Uh, that's the kind of thing we're doing. It's small, but that's the plan. Uh, that's about as specific as I can be because we haven't been successful enough for me to, to lay down more ideas. I, I gotta prove myself before you can take me seriously. Um, how am I on time? This time to the last question. One more? Uh, people mean very different things by the words web services what is the standard? Okay. Uh, by, by web services, um, the CIO folks here really do no more than I do. Uh, and, and I don't want to answer for them, so I'll, I'll give them an opportunity. What I mean by web services, though, is something accessible through the browser that does not require hard software on your desktop. It's, we want a space and the interface to this collaborative environment to be through your browser. One of the reasons for that is today, I'm uh, uh, the Office of Director of National Intelligence has its network, we share it with the CIA. If I go to NSA, I can't log on. Simply cannot log on. If I find a JWIX terminal or one of these common network terminals, maybe I have a log on account. I wanna make it 
so that if I can just get to the network and I, someone hands me a browser, I'm in. I can log in as me and my whole life appears. You'd think that's so simple to do, but it's not. If you do web services and we can consolidate some of these services through a DNI server, that's huge for us. That's what I mean by web services. It may not get to the details of your question, but I'm not the, I'm, I apologize, I'm not the uh, person to ask. There are CIO folks here and I know they would be happy to answer. And again, on the 13th, perfect question to pipe in. I think that was all the time I had, Tim. Yes, I, I want to end by thanking you. You've been very patient, you've been very gracious. Uh, our friends in, in the media, especially so recently, uh, you've taken the news of the Director of National Intelligence not being able to make it very well and better than I have, surely. Um, I hope you'll uh, appreciate that Tom Finger turned right around, got on a plane, because he did want to be with us. I, I think secretly he's kind of happy it turned out this way. Um, he's going to be introduced this evening by yet another young, very exciting person. I teased him. He's going to now have to suffer through two introductions by young folks. Uh, I think we're still going to have a wonderful banquet tonight. Um, when you leave here, whether you're inspired, you're mad, you think we got it right or wrong, we laid it out. Uh, we laid our hearts out, our minds out. I hope you'll take it in that spirit, feed it back. There is no pride of ownership. There's no ego here. Uh, please, even if it's not good, make it great. Thank you.